Welcome to the Secret Art of Business. Today, I am welcoming Robert Coles to the podcast. Welcome, uh, Robert, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's a delight to be on your podcast. I'm so excited about today and looking forward to our conversation. All right, fantastic. And Robert, you are the Senior Director of Digital and Creative Services at Stanford University, which alone is I think kind of cool. It's a cool title. It's a it's a cool school. My and bad. why don't you tell my audience what it is that you do there? Yeah, I uh, am in an area known as R and D E. R and D E is an auxiliary within the larger Stanford network. It is uh, essentially an operation that requires we earn revenue to exist. Uh, and we do a pretty decent job at earning revenue to exist. Our portfolio is a $3.2 billion portfolio. Uh, we oversee a large percentage of the campus. And uh, in that function, essentially what I do is I manage a team that uh, creates websites to video, print materials to social media postings. Uh, and we really focus on communicating to our students as well as faculty and, and staff. Um, the other thing that I do is I am a member of the Ideal Staff Advisory Committee, which is a committee that was formed by our previous provost. And essentially in that role, uh, I am very focused on DEI, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging activities for the university as a whole. And so uh, I get a, a lot of opportunities to produce items relative to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Uh, such as coordinating Juneteenth activities, Black History Month, Martin Luther King, um, programming and materials and communications around activities associated uh, and initiatives associated with DEIB. Uh, so uh, in my day job, really focused on the operational side of things, but in that capacity, I really get to talk about DEIB broadly. Oh, wow, so you got uh, a lot of work. <laughs> A little bit. And like and like two different two different paths you're going here. Do you find yeah. that um it stays pretty steady all year in, in both of those? I mean, or, or is the summer a little leaner or I mean, or is it steady? You know, it, it really comes in cycles. So with the R and D E aspect of, of you know, the focus of my job, uh, I deal a lot with students who are residing or living on campus. And so you'll see that there are different times of the year where you're focusing in communications on the graduate student. Uh, the majority of our graduate students now live on campus. Uh, when I first started, uh, about 11% of our graduate students lived on campus. And then uh, my first big project was to promote essentially a, a uh, residential complex, which is made up of 10 buildings. It has a pub, it has a market, it's got uh, uh, apartments, and the goal with that was to shift um, so that we could see more of our graduate students actually living on campus. And we were highly successful with that. We actually got to about 120% occupancy rate, which is, you know, you have a wait list. Uh, and so uh, you graduate students are at a different cadence than an undergraduate because our graduate students are postdocs, right? These are people who move to campus and make it their permanent residence. So they come in at different times of the year. And then the undergraduate student is on the regular cadence of, uh, we, are, we are on quarters at Stanford, not semesters, but generally you're gonna see the bulk of students coming in in the summer and departing at the end of spring. Uh, and then there's catering, conferences. Those are areas that I, I, I'm involved in. And those usually, spike up during the summer so it just you know it's it's sort of a calendar uh based mm -hmm, on different mm -hmm. audiences that uh keeps us pretty busy keeps me pretty busy throughout the year <laughs> i definitely appreciate your time then today um, thank you how did you get here how did you get to this particular job what's so can you tell us a little bit about your career path Yes. Well, uh, I'm a creative, so I look for creative opportunities. And uh, if I can, my, my youngest son is studying animation out here in California. He was actually at Columbus College of Art and Design for a year before he decided to, to pack up and, and move with my wife and my oldest, uh, my daughter, uh, out this way as well. And one thing that I tell him is, you're studying animation, but really 
you're exploring creativity and keep your options open. Uh, it's great that you have a discipline, but creativity creates pathways, Absolutely. right? And so that's kind of, that was my journey. I started off Columbus Public Schools, shout out to West High School in Columbus. I think it's <laughs> city schools now, it's Columbus Public Schools when I was there. Uh, went to uh, Columbus College of Art and Design, uh, studied there for five years. It was a four and a half year program, so I'd say five now it's where CCAD is back to four, which is great, or at four, not back, at four now. And uh, from there, I had an opportunity uh, to speak with some people at Limited. And when I was a student, they reviewed my portfolio. And I was really at that point where a lot was still being done by hand from a design standpoint, but we were transitioning to desktop publishing. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, my father-in-law now, who was uh, not my father-in-law at the time, um, uh, he was very savvy with computers. And so I got a lot of experience from him and then a lot of experience at CCAD as well in computer design and the traditional drawing and, and design skills and what have you. Um, but I got a call from, from limited and, uh, went out there, was doing paste up and there was this opportunity, several people were off and there was an opportunity to launch a few stores while I was there. And so they came to some of the, the folks who were doing pay stuff and they said, who really knows the, the digital side of things because we're doing desktop publishing. I was one of them. And uh, Kristen Harris, who you know quite well, yes. she was uh, an art director uh, there. And uh, I learned a lot from her. And so I, I, I did that for about a year, uh, went back to CCAD and started reviewing portfolios as an alumni. And then I also taught. I taught up to about five classes uh, per, per year. Got a lot of experience, decided through the provost at the time, uh, as she and I were talking, that I would get a graduate degree. And so I did go to Franklin University, uh, right there in Columbus, Ohio, got my graduate degree in marketing and communications. And I started a group called the CCAD Design Group. Because what I did as a thesis with the support of the provost was to say, listen, my experience as a designer is, yes, you get the academic teaching and you do get practice in the classroom, but there's nothing like that practical experience on the job. And how can we create a situation where students are getting that experience? And what I also saw is a minority coming from uh, Columbus Public Schools, I was competing against people from Hudson, Ohio, yeah. and New Albany, who had that technology because they had the, the means to get it. And I was seeing a deficit in my students who were from Mifflin High School. I don't know if Mifflin is still around now, but Mifflin High School, Brookhaven, these types of institutions, schools in, in uh, Cleveland, uh, public schools and, and the like. And so what we did is we created the CCAD design group and we insisted that we had students from all backgrounds and demographics and various disciplines, primarily time-based media, still-based media, i.e. photography, as well as the majority of them were designers. And we just, we stopped working with external uh, design firms for CCAD. This was when Denny was there. And all the design work was done by uh, students. And fortunately, we worked with Beth Bethke at Ology, and yeah. she created a standards guide. And the students were able to follow that standards guide. So they understood how you have a brand. This is your brand voice. This is your brand look and tone. And they started creating based on that. And uh, we were fortunate. We actually went to China to do some printing. We went to Taiwan to do some oh, printing. Wow. So they started getting these cultural experiences as well. And they were getting these experiences with people from different backgrounds within that internal structure as well. So that went well. Franklin got wind of that and uh, asked me, you know, I interviewed for a position at, at Franklin and I took a position as the creative director there, which was a great opportunity because then I was able to get experience relative to creating television commercials, me media, media buying, media placement, wow. creating media radio, so on and so forth. 
and uh, uh, had a outstanding time there. Uh, and uh, from that, sent my kids to school, all of them made it through, except my youngest. And uh, he was still in school. And then honestly, uh, a talent scout found me because of the things I was posting on social media. Uh, my social media is ubiquitous with, you know, I, I post things everywhere. <laughs> and uh, they they found me and uh, decided to go out and visit and loved it because it reminded me of Tuscany. And I had talked to my wife many, many years ago when we visited Italy. And I said, if I could find a, a, a you know, make a living in this type of environment, because I just loved it, I would do it. And so coming to Northern California on the visit, I experienced that and I haven't looked back. I, I love it's a it. Very it, long story. It, but no, it's, it's so good. And I think it's going to be really helpful for people that are listening, maybe people that are trying to plot their career, especially with a creative background. You created um, in your in your storytelling uh, a, a path that people can take. And it's it's always the next, you know, always think about the next thing. And you kind of preface that with um, the story of your son and that it's like, OK, you may be going to school for this, but what that is really going to do just open opportunities up. And you basically just laid out how you saw the opportunities you went for. It might have involved going back and getting a little more education. It might have involved, you know, maybe leaving a place you kind of liked, but it was a better opportunity, more experience. And it got you to basically what you're describing as your dream job right now, or at least a dream location um, of where you're living. So I think you said it was a long story, but I think it was just super informative. And if people didn't get it all the first time, they need to go back and listen to it again, because I thought it was really kind of cool and mine is similar in that there's a lot of crazy it's more of a maze i think than stair steps like you did but it was, it was all about just finding those opportunities and moving around and saying how what's going on over here this looks interesting and kind of just almost um just letting the path happen it let let the path be revealed to you just in your own creativity because what's great about being creative is that you can kind of sometimes see the vision before it's actually even there too. So it's like, you know, this is what I want. I can see it. If I go there, if I get brave, I can, I can do something else, which is really kind of cool. Yeah. I, I think you do have to be brave. And I do think to some degree, you have to be a soothsayer or a fortune teller in some way. So even, <laughs> you know, what we're seeing now with AI, you have to be fearless about the, the situation. Uh, but you also have to know your history, right. And understand um, how things have have evolved. You know, things are very scary conceptually, but there's ways as creatives that we can make it pragmatic and realistic. And, you know, I saw that with the potential uh, in the CCAD design group, and that was a conceptual thing. And and how can we position our students better to be more competitive? And they, they're all very successful. Many of them are creative directors or have their own businesses. Uh, they've done really well. And then even understanding, you know, at a young age, in college that uh, this desktop publishing piece is real. And there was a lot of rejection, right, Catherine? At the time it was like, oh, yeah. is it right? Yep. <laughs> and uh, well, no, it's not the same as doing um, Amber Lith and Ruby Lith and all of these, you know, uh, yeah. type of- That camera, um, and, that camera. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, but, you know, be, being able to, to kind of anticipate the future. And I think, Conceptually, as a creative, you know, we can see possibilities, uh, but we can also take those concepts, these sort of abstract ideas of what things will be and make them practical and realistic. And that's what I that's what I've tried to do. And I continue to do that at Stanford. Stanford is one of those environments, as you can probably imagine, where they really embrace the idea of thought. And uh, and there aren't really obstacles here. Right. You know, there's there are a lot of there's a lot of intellect and a lot of support around ideas. If you have an idea. Uh, there are people at Stanford that are going to help you realize those ideas. So keep keep thinking, keep being creative, and look for ways to realize your visions. Yeah, since you brought up AI, I'm going to touch upon that a little bit because we've also talked about how there was a time in order to be competitive, you had to know desktop publishing. I don't don't think we know if we call it that as much anymore, but. Um, I know, I'm pretty sure I got my first job because I was one of the very few candidates that knew how to use a Macintosh. 
And this ad agency wanted to step into the, they bought, invested all this money and all this stuff and nobody had, knew how to use it. And they were able to get somebody at an entry level that actually knew how to turn it on. But uh, for the rest of the design community, it brought panic. You know, it's like, oh my God, am I going to have a job? You know, the guy who, you know, would lay out all the type and like we said, cut the ruby lip and was a master of the sad camera. What, what did that mean for that guy? Um, I see AI a little bit like that. We have a massive tool now being inserted into our design spectrum, if you will. And I believe that the people that just stay on top of it, you don't have to master it quite yet, but just try it out, play with it a little bit, see what it's doing. You're going to be a, a huge step ahead of everybody else. And they're even still kind of tinkering with it right now too, because I would not rely on hundred percent for anything, especially because no. I keep making too many fingers on people and, and things like that. But, or even, or even some of the type is, you know, from stolen from somebody else, but they're going to get That's there. Right. So if you just, mm -hmm. you know, kind of just keep messing with it, because at least with the first max, all that design was horrible. And that's why I think that nobody thought it would, I mean, it was so pixelated and there was Lots. just a few types you could, you know, type fonts you could use and things like that. And they're like, oh, this will never catch on. This is a toy, but they figured it out. So it's gonna be the same thing. So I don't want people to panic when we start talking AI, just know that it is going to be a tool much like the Mac was or much like the computers were when they had this huge, you know, just revolution of, of change. Yeah, I, I'm right with you on that. And I think that, you know, there, it's going to create a situation where all of these ideas that people have, uh, because again, we're we're not at a deficit of concepts and ideas. No. It, it just gives you another mechanism to quickly and efficiently put those ideas out there. But you still need the human touch, Absolutely. I believe. Uh, right, so I, because even as long as I've been working and as much as I know about, or brand identity and that sort of thing. When you sit in front of a client, you sit in front of someone, they still want modifications and tweaks Absolutely. and they still want adjustments. And so what I've seen so far with AI is I can get some things out there, but really to put that fine touch onto it and really make it customizable for who we are as an institution or, or one of our uh, properties or sub brands, it really requires that human, human touch. Absolutely. And the, the one thing that I think about too, when we're going over to the Mac is that the art director still had all the great ideas. They just didn't know how to do it on a computer. It's the same thing where people think, oh, this is going to take my job because now people can type in whatever they want and get what they want. I can almost promise you the clients will never know what they want. So how can, no. <laughs> how, You're how, right about that. how do they even know how to type it in to ask for it? That's, that's exactly <laughs> well said. That is where the creators get to come in and actually deliver what they really want and get that message and the storytelling. I mean, they're not going to be great at it. Everybody's like, oh, I got a Mac now. I don't need a design team. And then that, give them an hour. And then they're like, I, I can't figure this out. So. Yeah. Where's that creative person? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Who knows how to work this? Um, <laughs> all right. I'm going to back up a little bit more with you. So, Robert, when you were a child, what did you do that was fun and creative? Use my imagination. Nice. And uh, I honestly, uh, just sitting and drawing, uh, building things was something that I absolutely love to do. And I had uh, a very supportive uh, mother, very supportive father. Uh, I will say, though, my grandmothers, uh, very strong, strong, powerful grandmothers. And uh, they were insistent that I be allowed to create and use my imagination and let that flame that they saw on me and that energy, because I spent a lot of summers with both of them uh, to continue. Uh, one of my grandmothers on my father's side, uh, she would take us to the art festival in downtown Columbus and uh, my sisters and me, and we just enjoy the artwork. And then I'd come back and she'd give me a piece of paper and I was able to draw it. Uh, I had family in Chicago. My father would take us and my grandmother uh, there during the summers as well. And she would take me to the museum and we would mm -hmm. just experience artwork. And one thing that I, I, I would stay at my mother's mother's house and uh, often I would read the dictionary and she was like, he wants to read the dictionary. And then I would take some of the words out of the dictionary and illustrate what I was thinking based oh, on what goodness. I read. 
And she said, you know, you have that ability to utilize both sides of your brain. And that's awesome. But I want you to make sure that you don't replace that drawing completely with the dictionary. And I never forgot that. And she actually gave me a a book uh, that it it, it, it was a a sort of a beginning book on sketching objects. And it's a book that I still have. So she invested in me with her time and her encouragement as well as, you know, this phys- physical publication and, and the experiences that, that I mentioned. And really, I, I just never stopped. You know, even in the classroom, my mother would talk to my teachers and say, this is what he loves. He's passionate about it. If there are ways to infuse that in what he was doing academically, can you do that? My father is very big on education. He was very active with speaking with my teachers. He was there uh, mm-hmm. all the time. And so those conversations would happen. And and ultimately, I actually had a teacher, Mr. Bernardi at West High. He built a class. He went to the city schools and the principal to do an art five class for me um, because I was so passionate. They only had art four at the time. Mm-hmm. I don't know what they have now, you know, 30 years ago or 20 years ago. And um, yeah, I was, I, I was able to take this art five and create. So I, I've always created and just use my imagination from G.I. Joe to Transformers yeah, to nice. you know, all of those things, uh, building these stories and then expressing these stories through writing. And then I also was at CCAD's Saturday morning classes. Oh, and cool. uh, so I got that formal sort of experience and I was surrounded by other artists, uh, which I think is really, really important as well is to be surrounded by people who are. Um, passionate about the things that you're passionate about, and and as a kid, you can have a passion, right? It's not right. does it, they you you see that in my grandparents and my parents saw that. Yeah, and it's not just restricted to adults. I mean, kids can have exactly. it as well. And I know you still have it because you are still drawing and creating amazing art. But let's expand on that a little bit. So um, you spend a lot of time doing creative things, but when you're not working, um, what are you doing? Oh, I do a lot (laughs) Uh, because I don't look at art as work. I look at art as enjoyment. I look at it as self-expression and it really satisfies me. And I'm still exploring. Uh, You know, I started college thinking that I would be a fine artist for a, a variety of reasons. I decided to go into the advertising, retail advertising, graphic design arena decision I'm happy with, but that, uh, interest and desire to produce fine art or illustrative works is something that's still in me. And that is ther- so ther- therapeutic to me, right? So I've, uh, I have I continue to do that. I do illustrations for friends and family members. A lot of it is just for free and, you know, something I, I do because I care about what I do and I care about the people that I do it for and they love my work and they support me. So it's it's wonderful to have that. Uh, I have illustrated five children's books. They are all published children's books. They're uh, focused on BIPOC characters. So the main protagonist is always a person of color. And uh, some of those are hand-drawn. Most of those are vector-based. Uh, I just received from my wife a wonderful uh, portable oil painting kit. So my house in Columbus had a studio over the garage. I still have the house, but the studio is gone. And I'm not there. And uh, in, in Northern California on the West Bay, uh, you know, space is at a premium. So I don't have a studio right now here. And But I do have a portable set because what we have in California, as you know, is beautiful, beautiful scenery and outdoors. Yep. Uh, and, and I live just two minutes off of the water and off of a beautiful trail. So I'm starting to uh, get back into oil painting as well. And then the other thing that I've just been really fortunate as an African-American male, and you know this, Catherine, there's, there aren't a lot of African-American males who are um, in the fine, in the uh, visual arts and doing it professionally and have been able to make a living off of it uh, for a whole multitude of reasons. Yes. But you just, you, you, you just rarely see it. And so I give back. I, I am a member of the Alumni Advisory Board for both Columbus College of Art and Design and uh, frankly, uh, university for both of those institutions, I've been a benefactor 
and originator of two scholarships. One is a Coles Endow Scholarship Fund, which is a full tuition scholarship at CC80, and then also a, a minority and inclusion scholarship uh, at Franklin University. I, I'm on a board of Access Books uh, Bay Area, which essentially creates libraries in, in California. Libraries are not funded by the state, which is unbelievable because they. I, I'm, I pay for everything else. I'm tech for everything. Uh, but uh, libraries, librarians and, and libraries are not funded. So this organization, essentially uh, what we do is we create libraries in schools if the poverty level is at 80% or, um, or higher. And in the Bay Area, you see that. Uh, in the West Bay, East Bay, it's 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 all around. It's 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 everywhere, and so uh, so that's another thing that I give my time and and effort to. And I just actually became a uh, member of the Redwood City Juneteenth Planning Committee, wow. and so uh, this will be our first big. I live in Redwood City, which is near Palo Alto, and uh, I w we are going to have our first big community Juneteenth celebration. City has done some smaller things, but this is the very big thing that we're doing this year. And uh, so very honored to, to be a part of that. But I create and find opportunity to create and do my best to give people resources and access to um, opportunities uh, when and where I can. I love it because you are just literally lit with, from within on this creativity thing. You just so passionate about it. And it's, it is even just creating events. I mean, I think people need to think about it's not just drawing, it's about just making something out of nothing. And the fact that, you know, you did this, you know, going to a public school and just kept going with the passion for it. That's the one thing I would like people to really understand too, that and, and why I asked them to think back to when they were a kid, because at some point, they were doing something that was really imaginative, be it GI Joe's or, you know, Legos or something or Lincoln Logs, yes. do you remember those? Yes. Um, I do remember. <laughs> and, and then at some, somebody had said to them, you know what, all right, you gotta, you gotta buckle down and, and study and get a job. And all of that is fantastic. You know, cheers to the left side of the brain too. But I will, always want people to think back, what did they do before they were told to buckle down? And that's as raw as your passion is going to be. And if they can, much like you, just stay in touch with it or go back and find that kid, and say, you know what, let's just build something or let's, what, what are my kids doing right now? And let me join them because that was fun when I did it. And it's just re-sparking all that creativity because it does help you in the long run to, you know, envision the future for yourself. Like you said, you, you kind of saw the next thing that you're going to do and it, or you could just keep reaching for something greater, you know, not settling. It's just like, what's, what's going to keep me excited? What's going to keep me interested? What's going to help me keep being creative and innovative? And go chase that, and it's so so vital. And I and I love that you're here to talk about that as a living example of how it can be done. So thank you for that. Well, well, well. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, it is absolutely outstanding to be uh, fortunate enough to have the creativity and and desire to do that and the ability to do that. But I do think, to your point, it is accessible. It's something that we all have within us, even if it was suppressed for some time and the things that I'm doing with the city and all of these other uh, entities, they have an art component. They have some sort of journaling or creating quilts or, you know, just contributing to a community art piece. And so I do encourage people to get out there and, and exercise your creativity because we all have it inside of us somewhere, somehow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you again so much. I appreciate your time today. And I will have uh, Robert's information in the podcast notes. So if you would like to see what he's up to or some of these events that he's working on, I can definitely include, include those links as well. So thank you again so much. Thank you. Can't wait for you to come visit me. Oh, I so want to. California. I so <laughs> want to. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you very much.